All I wanted to do was to create a spectrum analyzer like I had on my old stereo set. Lights out, 1989 Acid New Beat in the CD player, press play and enjoy the show. Now I got it done and this is the result. Now how hard can it be to make that in Python? It was really hard. I knew there were some challenges, like uh, reading a WAV file, play it to a sound device, and then transfer the amplitude signal to a frequency spectrum, and show it all graphically. But I got hopelessly stuck in the math. So I needed to back up a bit. I needed to do some research. And again, I saw the power of doing research in a Jupyter notebook. Now in this video, I'll show you how I found the correct math, build a visualizer, and play the music. And all you need to do is dim the lights. Let's go. Look at this diagram. On the x-axis you see frequencies. On the y-axis you see amplitudes. So the signal in the diagram is a frequency amplitude signal. But if you look at the WAV file I use, you see different information. On the y-axis there is still the amplitude, but on the x-axis there is just time. At each given moment there is an amplitude. Its value is a combination of all the frequencies at that moment. It is this complex combination of frequencies that makes something sound like a piano or a cat or your noisy neighbor. Let me show it to you. I play the song and all that moves is the time. As I said, at each time there is an amplitude made out of many different frequencies. How can I demonstrate this? With a spectrum analyzer. And there is one in Ableton Live. Now you are looking at all the frequencies that were in the audio file at any given time. Now how on earth does that work? To show you I need to rewind to the simplest audio possible. A sine wave. It is this sine wave I will experiment with in a Jupyter notebook. I already know I will need NumPy and Matplotlib. I install them. And import them. I choose sample rate 44.1 kHz, just like my audio file will have later. The root note is the frequency for an A note. Now the frame length is an interesting value. Now a WAV file is a collection of samples. Each sample is called a frame. Now in a standard WAV file each frame contains 32 bits of information. That is 16 bits for the left channel and 16 bits for the right channel. Now my first question during this research was how can these individual frequencies be reverse engineered from a single frame? And the answer is it can't. I'm going to use an algorithm called fast Fourier transformation. This algorithm requires a collection of frames as input. Now, this collection is known as a window. Now, for uneventful audio, like a background sound, this window can be big. In fact, you can feed the whole audio file into the algorithm, and so you will get all the frequencies over all the time. For fast moving data, like a song, which is snappy, we need a small window. I will try a window of 512 frames. I create the sine wave and plot it. The diagram shows the time amplitude signal. Now I create a second node at half the volume, four octaves higher and mix it with the original signal. The signal is more complex and contains two notes. A Fourier transformation is used to extract the individual frequencies. Both frequencies are visible, but the image is mirrored. This symmetry is commonly referred to as folding. Notice that the frequency goes from roughly minus 22,050 to plus 22,050. 
The number 22050 is half of the sample frequency I used and is known as the Nyquist frequency or folding frequency. Now to allow a good non-distorted signal, you always need to double the sample frequency of the spectrum you're trying to capture. The sample that I will use later also has a Nyquist frequency around 22 kilohertz. Now this number is based on what the human ear can hear. And that is why CDs sample at twice that frequency, namely 44.1 kHz. You will always need to double the sample frequency of the Nyquist frequency to prevent signal distortion. But enough math lessons. My frequency analyzer is only interested in the right part of the diagram and NumPy has a function for that as well. And that is the information I want. Notice that the peak is around 120. I'm not sure what this value means yet, but I'll deal with that later. Step 1 is done. We have an algorithm that takes audio data and breaks it up into individual frequencies. We converted time domain analysis to frequency domain analysis. And that leaves me with loading a real wave, reading data from it, sending data to the audio device, perform the Fourier analysis and visualize the spectrum. By the way, a spectrum analyzer is called that way because a spectrum is a collection of things that make up a continuum. In our case, the continuum is the Nyquist frequency range, which will be broken up in bands of subfrequencies. Together, they form a spectrum. Now to play audio, I will use a library called Pi Audio. You can pip install it from PyPy. On macOS, I also had to brew install port audio because Pi Audio depends on it. The second Python library I use is Piglet. I use it to create a window and visualize the spectrum. And of course, I will use NumPy, which you can also pip install. Now that all the preparation is out of the way, let's have some fun. I'm going to start with a window that shows 8 bands. Each band has a frequency number and an orange rectangle for the amplitude. I installed the libraries in a virtual environment and added two test wave files to the project. Class Renderer subclasses a piglet window. It creates 8 bands. Right now their values are 1 to 8, but we'll fix that in a minute. I created a list for the band bars and labels. And then I iterate the bands and create a bar and label for each. I create a start method. This creates a game loop that calls an update and draw method on an interval. If you are not familiar with this technique, search my channel for Piglet videos. I made quite a few of them where I explain how that works. I implement an empty update method. And a draw method. Now, that should do the trick. I create a renderer and start it. Yeah, that works. Right now I need to stop it with Ctrl C. That is because of the infinite loop here. Be careful not to let this run forever as it might make your computer very hot. Anyway, we'll change this code soon so that problem will go away. Now the next step is to load the wave file. First we'll use a test wave. It sounds like this. I open the WAV file and print its information. I import WAV and run the code. And that works. Let me stop manually again. I got the correct info from the WAV file. Now let's see if I can get it to play. Now this is actually a bit tricky and that has something to do with my game loop. 
Now you see Piglet needs a game loop, but so does Pi Audio. That's the library I use to send a stream of audio to my sound device. Now who will control the main loop? What I will do is the following. I keep the event loop I created, but just before starting it, I will open an audio stream in callback mode. So to understand what that means, I recommend you to read the Pi Audio documentation. For this video, the only thing you need to understand is that Pi Audio allows you to create a callback function to provide sound bytes, which then will be streamed to the audio device. Now, let me show you. The first thing I do is accept the audio file and pass it here. I define a sample window. I create the callback function that will be called by the Pi Audio framework. So when the audio device is ready to eat some bytes, I read them from the WAV file and return them. Now it could be that the audio is depleted at the end of the file and I should check if data is indeed available. But for this tutorial, I'm just going to ignore that. I import Pi Audio. And then start to stream audio. And I can now use the stream to control the game loop. Yes! Well, that works. But now for the hard part. Analyze the signal and make these bars move. The callback function is called whenever the sound device asks for bytes. In fact, each time it asks for 512 frames because I specified that. 512 frames are read from the WAV file. But what is in a frame? Well, each frame contains 32 bits of data, 16 for the left channel and 16 for the right channel. And one of these bits is the sign. This allows negative and positive values. I created another video on visualizing WAV files and I'll put a link to it in the description. All you need to know for now is this. For each frame, I just need a value from minus 32,768 to plus 32,768. So this is what I do. I convert the bytes to an array of integers. And how that works, you see in the video I just spoke about. The next thing to do is take only one channel of the stereo file. I could also convert the audio to mono, but this is fast and good enough for what I want. Finally, I perform the fast Fourier transform and store the result in an attribute so I can use it in the update function. The question is, how much data did I get here? Apparently, each frame of 512 samples got me 257 frequencies. And indeed, that is what the documentation says. So there are 257 frequencies in the list from index 0 to index 200. 56. If each space between two frequencies is a band, the result is 256 bands. My guess is that is the reason for the plus one here. If you have any ideas about this, please let me know in the comments. Anyway, that's nice and all, but how do I compress 256 bands to the eight bands I want to see here? Well, since I'm not the biggest math wizard and have no clue if NumPy can do such things, I'm gonna do it with some brute force. But what are the found frequencies anyway? 
Well, I could see them already in the research I did. The RFFT freak function produced a list of them. So the list of amplitudes has 257 elements, just like the list of frequencies. So I could just really distribute 256 bands evenly into 8 buckets. Except for one thing. Look at the spectrum analyzer in Ableton again. Notice that the scale is logarithmic. It is also limited around 10 kHz. Apparently this is the area of interest. So I'll first create 8 bands on a logarithmic scale. NumPy can do this with a single function. I'll implement it. Ok, that creates 8 frequencies ranging from 100 to 10,000 Hz. I also need to create a list of frequencies that were generated by the Fourier function. Now we can implement the update function. I initialize the target band buckets to zero. And I iterate over the bands. In the loop I iterate the Fourier frequencies. Now if they match the band, I store the largest value. I now got the highest value for each bucket. I'll use it to set the height if it is higher than the current height of the bars. Else I slowly drop the height. Now I'm curious, does that work? Well, you bet. But a bit too much. The amplitudes are way too high. Now the best way to deal with this is to normalize the generated values. But I'll be honest with you, I just could not find a normalize function for the Fourier transform. So I'm going to do a quick fix. I'll divide the values and I'll start with 1000. Yep, that's better. And I'll divide by more. And that does the trick. Now of course this links the amplitude values directly to the heights, which will cause problems when the sample configuration changes. But for this tutorial, it's good enough. And I can demonstrate this by playing a real audio file. Wait, let me fix one thing. Perhaps you've noticed the bar started all at half of the height and I'm going to initialize them at zero. To me it's fascinating to look at this thing. It is so simple and yet so elegant. And as you have seen, quite some things had to come together to create it. I've been wanting to create something like this since 40 years when I first tried it on my Commodore 64. But I only could do it in basic so it would have been way too slow and I would not have even known where to start back then. And this reminds me of something else I saw in the 80s and that's this. If you want to understand how things work, you have to build them yourself. Now, the same applies for artificial intelligence and neural networks. And if you want to know more about that, click here and we'll see each other in the next video.